Hello again, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University Law School, the Lubar Center. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. Today, we're having the second of two conversations about the importance of the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. system of justice and the rule of law in this year's election cycle. Last week, we talked to the president of the American Constitution Society, Russ Feingold, the former Wisconsin senator. Today, we are joined by Sarah Isger and David French. They are co-hosts of the Dispatches podcast advisory opinions. Before we get started, let me tell you just a little bit about both of our guests today. Sarah Isger is a, a, an attorney, a staff writer at the Dispatch. She has worked on a number of different Republican presidential candidate uh, campaigns as, as an advisor. Uh, she's a former deputy communications director for the Republican National Committee. She worked as a spokesperson for then Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and she's currently a political analyst for CNN. David French is also an attorney, senior editor at The Dispatch and a columnist for Time. And David has a new book out called um, Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. So we hopefully will have a little bit of time to talk about David's new book too. So thanks to, to both of you. David is in Tennessee today and Sarah, uh, through the miracles of technology is with us from Virginia. It's good to have you both on the program today. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. So let's talk a little bit about what's been happening at the U.S. Supreme Court and the importance of an appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court in this election cycle. Does it make a big difference to voters this year to have the, the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett and the confirmation of, of Justice Barrett? Does it make a difference or, or has this all been overshadowed by the pandemic? And Sarah, I'll begin with you. So... The likelihood of election litigation for this cycle feels higher, I think, because there's just this general tension in the country. But there actually are some reasons why it might be higher, which is because of the expansion of mail-in ballots because of the pandemic. Mail-in ballots have a lot of problems with them, not the least of which is uh, what we've already seen in litigation. The post stamps on when they arrive, which ones get counted, signature matching. And so you think back to Bush v. Gore and the theory behind that was an equal protection violation, right, of uh, some counties were counting ballots differently than other counties. So what in theory could happen this time is that some counties within a state or some states versus other states are, for instance, not using signature matching at all, despite what the law in their state says, and other states are using very strict signature matching. Um, you could also have uh, sort of disparate impact signature matching, where in one precinct, they've thrown out 30% of the ballots for the signatures not matching, but in another precinct, despite having the same policy, they're only throwing out 2% of the ballots um, based on signatures not matching. You could see any of those types of cases go to the Supreme Court. But a really important thing to remember as well is that Bush v. Gore, while we all think of it as a 5-4 case, was actually 7-2 on the equal protection violation. It was 5-4 on the remedy and whether they still had time to count more ballots uh, before the there's basically like a constitutional deadline for the electoral college. And so all of these states have to be certified before then. Um, but, you know, I think especially under the Roberts court, you will see a hard push if there is any election challenge to ensure that it's not a 5-4 decision. Uh, and so in that sense, the addition of Amy Coney Barrett certainly makes it a nine person court instead of an eight person court. So if it were to be 5-4, you want that fifth person because, of course, a 4-4 court ties and the lower court decision then stands. That would not be great for this contested election of all contested elections. Um, but do I think that there will be a 5-4 decision if there's any election litigation? I don't think so in a Roberts court, regardless of ACB or anyone else who would be there. David, in uh, most election years, I think the, the conventional wisdom is, is that uh, the courts, the importance of the courts, the Supreme Court in particular, uh, is a big motivator uh, for right. Republicans and much more so than Democrats. Do you think that's the case this year or has the, the fairly compressed process of the Barrett nomination and confirmation, has that motivated Democrats in a different way than past elections have? Well, I don't think Democrats could be motivated to dislike Trump more. <laughs> so I think the the Democratic distaste for Trump was fully baked in before the Amy Coney Barrett nomination. I have heard some people say, well, 
you know, sort of playing this nine dimensional chess that by putting Barrett on the court, did that did the GOP remove some incentive for otherwise wavering Republicans to vote for Trump? Uh, that people are uncomfortable but really appreciate the court. And now that there's a 6 3 Republican nominated majority, would they stay home? And right. You know, I don't I don't know how we can empirically measure that really, but I sort of the eye test and the I know the plural of anecdote is not data, <laughs> but um, the, what I'm seeing from uh, Trump supporting evangelicals, including uncomfortably Trump supporting evangelicals, for example, is that the Amy Coney Barrett nomination and confirmation just confirmed that Trump delivers. And so it's only been in that sort of in that world to his credit. Now, are there some voters somewhere who might have said, well, if Amy Coney Barrett was still out there and I had to vote in Trump to get her the nomination, well, then I'm going to hold my nose and vote for Trump. I don't know. That feels like a vanishingly small number of people. Um, I just think everything is at, at this point, the attitudes are pretty darn baked in. Mm -hmm. It actually, David, reminds me of the split ticket voter issue. A lot of people think there's all these Republicans who are unwilling to vote for Trump at the top of the ticket, but then will vote for Republican senators on the way down. I know that's not a perfect measure of the Amy Coney Barrett potential mm -hmm. voters, but for me, it's actually kind of similar. And uh, incredibly, the numbers are, no, those people don't exist. Uh, there's 4% or so of people who are going to vote for one candidate for president and the opposing party's candidate for Senate. And they're actually not at all, all on one side or the other. And so they end up balancing each other out. And what you see is that the numbers for president are gonna be like very, very, very close to the numbers for Senate. And we saw that in 2016, you know, uh, Trump lost New Hampshire by 0.16% and Ayotte lost by 0.73%. You saw the same thing in North Carolina and a bunch of the states. The only one that was an outlier was Florida where Rubio outperformed Trump Trump by about six points. So no evidence that there are these highly strategic voters out there. <laughs> so you're saying the never Trump Republican vote, Sarah, is not statistically significant? Is, is that <laughs> what I hear you say? <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, something that Russ Feingold said when I talked with him a week ago. And, 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 you know, he's a guy who spent 16 years on the Judiciary Committee. I think he was involved with four different nominations, uh, actually voted for Chief Justice Roberts. And, and he said to me that he felt that this process for the Barrett nomination was rushed, that there was not enough time to, to fully vet it, that, that it just felt hurried. And, and to quote him, he said it was outrageous, disgusting and totally wrong. Those were his words, which I said, those sound like strong words, Senator. He said, yes, they are very strong words. And he said that he feels like it has delegitimized the court. It made it seem like it's a political animal, something which even our polling has suggested the court's been pretty good at avoiding. It's not viewed that way. Do you think anything about the Barrett process changes the way people view the court? Do they view it as a more political animal now than they did prior? Sarah, I'll, I'll begin with you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so... I think one of those things can be false and the other one can be true. I think that the, uh, you know, whether a process is rushed or not is in the eye of the beholder to a, a large extent. These are political processes. Would anything have changed if the process had been another three weeks? No, the votes weren't going to change. No Democrat was going to vote for her and no Republican was going to change their vote against her based on having an additional three years to look into Amy Coney Barrett's record. So in that sense, I think it's a little silly to say that it's rushed. Um, you know, if the purpose is not to inform senators for their votes, and I don't know what the purpose is really. And unless uh, Senator Feingold is going to say that there was any chance of those people changing their vote, I think that's a silly argument. Now, did it politicize or delegitimize the court? Sure, I think it could still do that regardless of the process and whether it was or was not rushed. Um, I think that the court has increasingly become a political punching bag. David and I have talked about this a ton, whereas Congress has largely uh, let go of all of its real responsibilities over to the administrative state and the executive branch, uh, more and more and more is having to get resolved by the courts because Congress just isn't legislating at all. And because of that, they become more politically involved. And then the parties actually use it more and more as a political punching bag. I think the biggest example of this is back in 2012, when the court 
was in a presidential election year looking at the Obamacare program for the first time, law for the first time, uh, in the Sebelius case. And Obama basically said he was going to run against the Supreme Court. If they struck down Obamacare, he was going to make the Supreme Court his number one issue heading into the election. Now, of course, the Supreme Court didn't strike down Obamacare. But I think you saw at that moment where presidents were going to use the Supreme Court as their issue, that by definition will politicize the court regardless of what the court does. Now, in addition, is there some argument that the court itself has caused itself to be a little bit more of that political punching bag? And uh, (laughs) as David likes to say, you know, there's some version of like hold my beer and or Leroy Jenkins as they (laughs) run toward the problem. Um, Sure, I think Roberts would like to shut that down and he would like to never decide another cultural political issue again at the court, but you've got, you know, a spicy Alito and Brett Kavanaugh in this latest Wisconsin case, you know, heading into the fight. <laughs> David, you want to weigh in on that one? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think rushed is the right critique. Um, Amy Coney Barrett was uh, confirmed in 2017 in a pretty darn contentious nomination fight. Um, her views were vetted then. Um, no, as Sarah said, no Democrat was going to vote for her anyway. There, there has been, I mean, year, she's been under the microscope or in the spotlight for some time, and there just hasn't been skeletons dredged up. I mean, we, we know who she is. The, the, the argument that, that is true is a bunch of Republicans were deeply hypocritical. I mean, they just completely did not do what they said they would do. Um, Lindsey Graham said that if this is something that uh, comes up when a Republican is in power, hold me to it. Hold me to it. Marco Rubio was very clear. Portman was, I mean, you could go down the line and then they just said, and then the argument was almost like, well, it's laughable. It's absurd to think you'd hold us to our word. How dare you believe us? Yeah. How (laughs) dare you believe what we said four years ago? And, and, you know, and a lot of my, one year ago. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Some of them were four, some of them were one. And a lot of my friends on the right were sort of like, what, what? why would you hold these people to their word on something this important? And is so in that sense, it's an escalation. And, and a, a lot of the, essentially the, the justification for it was, well, we've got the constitutional power to do it. You would do it if you were on the other side. And so therefore, stop, stop, with, stop with the nonsense about illegitimacy. This is completely legal. This is completely constitutional. We have the power. We won our election. But the problem is there's not much of a limiting principle to that. So it's completely legal. It's completely constitutional to add a state to the union. It's completely legal. It's completely constitutional to add justices to the Supreme Court. And so where what we're in is in a situation where one side escalates and they'll say this far and no further. And, And the other side says, well, I didn't consent to this far and no further. And so the incentive is laying out there for another escalation. So, so let me follow up on that, David. How aggressively, let's say, uh, let's create this scenario where Joe Biden is elected, the Democrats take back the Senate and still control the House. How aggressively do you expect the Democrats to pursue changes based on their unhappiness, their disillusionment on what's happened with the court? How aggressive will they be, in your opinion? I think it would be a big mistake to come right out of the gate and be aggressive about court packing. It's not something that is particularly uh, popular and they have other parts of their political platform that are popular. So it seems to me that if you're going to be sort of a smart on, if there is a Biden administration, a smart way to introduce the Biden administration to the American public is by pursuing popular legislative initiatives right off the bat. Coronavirus relief, bailouts for financially strapped cities and states, perhaps um, healthcare reform, pres- you know, the, all of these things that are parts of the popular popular parts of the democratic platform. I think they go straight to court packing immediately. Things get very culture war contentious right out of the bat. Um, probably almost impossible to avoid that eventually, but it just gets contentious right out of the bat. I think the smarter way to do it is to remember what eventually happened when Franklin D Roosevelt tried to court pack. He sort of held, even though there was bipartisan opposition, he, he made these threats and the, the, 
the court, the nine person court was ultimately saved, not so much by the legislative process, but the court itself saying, huh, and there was a switch in time that saved nine, that there was a switch in jurisprudence on the part of the one of the justices that tilted the balance. So I think what might end up happening really is that let's say the court is considering whether to take a big abortion case that you will have if there's a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate and, the, and a Democrat president, it would be sort of like the sword of Damocles hanging over their heads saying, interesting uh, cert grant decision here, Supreme Court, nice, n- nice little nine person court you got, if you can keep it. Be a real and, shame what happened to it. <laughs> yeah. And what will, how will the justices react to a credible threat to pack the court in response to a potential court ruling? Um, I think the Democrats could achieve the kind of judicial influence that could theoretically and conceivably achieve the kind of judicial influence they seek without even packing the court. Sir, do you think Democrats will move aggressively uh, to, to, to take on things like anything from term limits to court packing? So my, the political operative in me has a different take on what you do in a situation like this. And I think an informative moment was in 2008 when Obama had both the, you know, all of Congress and the presidency and what he didn't do. And they didn't tackle immigration. Why that's interesting is because it was politically beneficial not to. They basically were able to blame the fact that they didn't do immigration on Republicans, even though they controlled both houses in Congress. And then they were able to use it as a fantastic weapon to energize their base. So what you want to do with an issue, like David said, it is actually not a particularly popular issue, but it's very, very popular among base progressives. So you want to not do anything about it and run on it for as long as you can. <laughs> uh, and how, how do you do that exactly? If, if you control all the all of the uh, the branches, if you control anyway, the, the White House, the, the Senate, and the, and the House. That's right. I mean, it's not, I mean, the same thing they did with immigration. They just said Republicans prevented us from doing it and they don't like immigrants and they continue to run on that. And yeah, you'd hear sometimes like, well, why didn't you do it when you had both houses? And they're like, well, Republicans. Um, And believe it or not, that's actually very effective. Uh, What you want then for them in this case is to turn Democrats into the court voters that they've never been before. Mm -hmm. Republicans in general were uh, voting on the court, you know, double digits more than Democrats were. It's always a little hard to pin down. Like David said, some of that polling's a little side eye, but um, if Democrats can use this as an issue to increase turnout, that's far more beneficial to individual Democrats than packing the court is. And you always have to think of these political decisions, not as the Democratic Party, but as individual people making decisions to protect their seats, to get reelected themselves, to increase you know, the majority if they're in the Senate or the House. Uh, and so I actually expect that they will use this as a political talking point, maybe to bully the court as well as David suggested, Um, but to increase enthusiasm and turnout by sort of continually promising to do something about the court. (laughs) David, why why would expanding the court be a bad idea? The the argument you hear from Democrats is we're a different nation than we were, um, you know, centuries ago. Uh, We're bigger, we're more diverse. The court should reflect some of the changes that have occurred in this country. What's the, the flaw in that argument from your perspective? I mean, you know, the the problem is that you would, every escalation is accompanied by an equal and, well, I will say this, every escalation is accompanied by a greater and opposite additional escalation. (laughs) So if you add, let's say you you add four justices to take it from a 6-3 Republican appointed majority to a 7-6 Democratic appointed majority, the filibuster is gone. There will be united Republican control again at some point. And if that 7-6 majority has um, diminished religious liberty, has uh, shored up, a pre- uh, even to a greater degree, shored up protection for abortion rights, um, uh, has essentially overruled the Heller um, case that established an individual right to keep and bear arms. If it's done these things, the pressure on Republicans to turn that 7-6, say, into an 8-7 Republican nominated majority will be overwhelming. And so there won't, there won't be a limiting principle. You'd have, you might end up, you know, years down the line, you've got a house of representatives and then a, 
and the, the Supreme Court is essentially the house of adjudication. <laughs> it has got a large number and a growing number of justices, all politically engineered to try to achieve certain results. Now, that's an extreme, that, that's sort of playing out an extreme scenario. But if we continually escalate, the question is always, where does this stop? And, and that's one of the reasons why back um, uh, several weeks ago, I proposed a, a compromise that was probably the most immediately rejected, resoundingly <laughs> column I've ever written in my Doesn't life. Doesn't mean it was a bad idea, though, David. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my proposal was somebody's got to stop the escalation, and maybe this is an opportunity. You nominate Amy Coney Barrett, you have a hearing, but then you don't vote until after the election. And if if Trump wins, <clears throat> excuse me, if Trump wins, that that is that decides it. If Trump loses and Republicans will in the lame duck still have that Senate majority, they go to the Democrats and they say, we would, we will confirm her, but we need to, unless you compromise and agree not to pack the court or agree not to add states, et cetera, which sort of would try to freeze things where they are. And that was immediate. I mean, <laughs> that was so reason, even some of my um, friends who are anti-Trump conservatives who've been with me every step of the way, like I'm getting text messages and they said, too far, <laughs> too far. We, we can't go with that. I think the hey. jurisdiction stripping suggestions may actually be the most likely to happen. I think even Democrats are a little wary of, you know, what would become a 60 person court. Um, but the idea that when they pass, uh, you know, the Green New Deal, that it will basically say this is um, unreviewable by the Supreme Court. Uh, that seems actually pretty likely because again, mm. um, could you even, if that amendment were added, would Pelosi have the political will to get rid of that amendment? The Republicans certainly wouldn't have the votes to get rid of that amendment. And so all of a sudden jurisdiction stripping becomes uh, more common and popular from both sides. And then you have the court deciding whether that in and of itself is constitutional and you could sort of create a new Marbury versus Madison type ruling that could be that, that to me seems actually pretty likely uh, to happen in the next four years. I, I Another possibility you, is lower yeah. court packing is, mm. is oh, adding okay. district court positions, mm. adding circuit court positions, which would be far less controversial, but quite consequential. And the Reinhold, uh, don't forget his, his old saying, he was on the ninth circuit and was considered sort of the most progressive liberal guy on the ninth circuit and he would just not, he would ignore Supreme Court precedent. <laughs> his his yeah. quote on that in one speech was, they can't catch them all. <laughs> hey, I want to ask you each a question about what kind of justice uh, Amy Coney Barrett will be. And I, th I think each of you have said something to the effect of that she will not be, your prediction is she will not be as revolutionary as the left fears or the right wishes. Uh, I found that interesting. What, what did you mean by that? Either one of you can start and I've got a question for the other one. So go ahead. David. Yeah. So I, I wrote a whole piece that said she's evolutionary, not revolutionary. And that is if so, she's essentially an originalist um, justice who, you know, she clerked for Scalia. I wouldn't say that she's and I actually hope she's not a Scalia clone. Um, there are Scalia rulings that I think are deeply misguided. For example, Employment Division v. Smith. Um, that's like his main example. Like that, just get him started on Smith and like you are heading down a path that you will never get to turn around. It's not a trail. It's not a loop. You just never come back. <laughs> Don't, I've got an, I would say I have an album side. I have like a nine disc album collection on Employment Division v. Smith. I've got a dartboard of the opinion. But um, so I, I think that, if you look at the courts, the direction of the court's jurisprudence, a lot of it is was heading in a particular direction before Barrett. Um, there wasn't a lot of uh, of there wasn't a lot of five four um, five four decisions that she was going to jump in and be the fifth deciding vote for. So, for example, in the Bostock case, where Justice Gorsuch joined with Justice Roberts and the then the four Democratic uh, appointees to extend Title VII protections to LGBT Americans, that was 6-3. Even if Amy Coney Barrett got on the court and wanted to reverse Bostock, it's still a 5-4 majority for it. Um, many of the religious liberty cases, in fact, the vast majority of the religious liberty cases decided in the last decade have been decided all in favor of religious liberty. It's a 15-case winning streak. And most of those by a 7-2, or 6-3 majority. So she'll just entrench the existing trend there. As far as abortion law goes, 
you know, this is something that we'll just have to see. But as of right now, there is exactly one justice on the Supreme Court who has unequivocally said that Roe and Casey are should be in question. One, and that's Clarence yeah. Thomas. And and so the other eight have voted in different cases. Well, the other seven, Amy Coney Barrett's brand new, but seven of the remaining eight have voted in different cases to apply some version of the Casey standard. So I'm extremely skeptical of the idea that that Roe is now suddenly in danger. It could be, but I'm very skeptical of that. So I think there's just trends that she will reinforce as opposed to a direction of the court that she will change. Sarah, should people read anything into the fact that at the ceremony at the White House this week, uh, Clarence Thomas was the one, Justice Thomas was the one uh, who was present. Um, there were people who read that as saying, well, that, that sort of may, may give us a little bit of an insight into where she sees herself, who she sees as part of her kinship on the court. I don't think so. Uh, Clarence Thomas is one of the most beloved justices on the court. People have a lot of attachment to him. They personally like him. He's the quietest justice, of course, on the bench, but not on the bench. He's not very quiet and uh, it's, it's just really well loved. So I, I read more into it, that and her mm -hmm. uh, personal feelings toward him. Uh, and of course, having the ceremony at the White House, despite what Twitter says, is incredibly common. Uh, FDR was the first one to do it, by the way, and then it fell out of favor again. Reagan brought it back and from Reagan on, I believe every justice has had one of their oaths at the White House and the other one at the court. Uh, and I attended uh, Kagan's at the her fet at the White House. Uh, so there was this sense that this was overly politicized. When it was then the history was brought up, I then saw people say, well, but this is so close to an election. Like, that's not Amy Coney Barrett's fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a lot of people's fault, by the way, but not hers. Uh, I think that David raises all the right points on what the court will look like. He left off one thing, though, that's worth mentioning, which is the Roberts factor. Roberts thought that he was going to get to be the swing vote, the chief swing vote. And that uh, was a sort of double bounce power because as the swing vote, you obviously have a lot of power. But as the chief, you assign majority opinions. So, yeah, he just lost his swing vote privileges, if you will. But he still gets to assign the majority opinions. And so I think even in an abortion case, you know, if a June medical, for some reason, were granted cert, again, uh, after Hellerstadt, then June Medical, and they try for it one more time, you're going to see the chief assign himself that opinion and make it the narrowest majority opinion. And yep, there might be, you know, three concurrences on it with a bunch of the other justices writing separately, but the chief is going to be the one writing for the court. I think you'll see a lot more chief opinions. You know, in the past, we used to do bingo, David and I, um, and our bingo card would tell us which justice was most likely to be writing an opinion because they generally evenly space them out. That is a court uh, that's, you know, not written anywhere, but that's a court tradition that uh, could change now. I want, I want to spend a little time talking about a couple of other things uh, today. Uh, I want to talk about the attorney general, Bill Barr. Um, and, and Sarah, I, I guess I'll begin with you because of your experience with the attorney general's office. I mean, you worked with uh, Jeff Sessions uh, when he was attorney general. Um, how would you characterize what you've seen from, from Bill Barr in, in his role? How has he performed? Has he surprised you in any way? I think you're catching me in sort of a punchy mood, maybe. So here's what I'll say. <laughs> That's um, good. We like that. Yeah. <laughs> For 18 months, so I was the director of public affairs for the Department of Justice when Jeff Sessions was attorney general. So it's uh, basically a department head that does all of the media and public facing work for 120,000 employees in the department. And uh, it was just accepted that it was known that the president was mad at attorney general Jeff Sessions because he recused himself from the Russia investigation, putting Rod Rosen's uh, sign in charge, who then appointed Robert Mueller as special counsel. Just fact, right? Yeah, so Bill Barr comes in as attorney general and they're all like, oh, it was such a mistake for Sessions to recuse and blah, 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 blah. 
and the president is still tweeting at the attorney general, still attacking the Department of Justice. And so I just hope that everyone can revisit perhaps why the president <laughs> was attacking the Department of Justice under Jeff Sessions. And maybe the assumptions over why that was happening turn out not to be true. And my other pieces of evidence for that are that the president was attacking the Department of Justice when it uh, uh, we indicted two Republican congressmen in separate incidents for uh, campaign uh, law related violations. And the president tweeted that, you know, that was inappropriate to indict people of his political party because that could hand the seats to Democrats, not how the Department of Justice works. So this idea that it was just over the recusal, I'm just, it, it's a, <laughs> you don't, you hate to see it happen, but it maybe feels just a little nice uh, to see that all of those folks who blame Jeff Sessions for recusing himself and causing the rift between him and the president can like check out the Twitter feed now. David, you want to get in on that one? So can I refer to um, my son's high school basketball coach and his description of the intent behind his zone press defense? <laughs> that that sounds good I mean, for sports okay. fans. We'll love that, David. Go ahead. I, I, you know, I remember many hours sitting in that high school gym, and I would hear the coach yell, "Pressure burst pipes! Pressure burst pipes!" And that is when you put pressure on a system, um, whether it's a you know a, a basketball offense or a Department of Justice, you will begin to see cracks in the seams, and you will begin to see. Things that occur with when there's relentless pressure placed on a system, it takes a person of extraordinary fortitude, especially when that pressure is coming from the most powerful person in the world who is also your boss. It takes extraordinary fortitude to stand firm. You know, and so, for example, um, the relentless attacks on Jeff Sessions when he did the right thing, did the right thing by recusing himself from the Russia investigation. Um, that caused an immense amount of pressure. Attorney General Barr is under immense amount of pressure. And I don't agree with the way he's responded to all of that pressure, quite frankly. Like, I, I don't agree with his intervention, the way that he has reversed course in the DOJ prosecution of the uh, Michael Flynn case, for example. Um, but it's, it's still, still, even though he has yielded to, it seems to have yielded to administrative pressure on a number of fronts, he's still under more pressure you know, do something about Hunter Biden, do some, it just never ends. And so, you know, one of the things that I hope, whether the Trump administration ends in 2021 or 2025, to see is a, a restoration of at least some sort of arm's length relationship between the presidency and the attorney general, that one, once the attorney general is, is nominated and confirmed that the DOJ, it's not an independent agency, obviously. Um, but that there should be a degree of separation, of practical day-to-day -day separation between the president and the attorney general. And we don't see that. And, and it causes pressure on the system. And as my son's coach said, Coach Fox says, pressure bursts pipes. So, yeah. so let me, I, I, I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I didn't mean to interrupt, go ahead. No, the only, on a, on a very serious note for me, there were a lot of people who entered this administration thinking that they could appease the president in some ways in order to prevent bigger violations of norms, perhaps in other ways. And I think that the last 18 months or so of the Department of Justice proves that um, you can compromise all along the way. And to David's point, the, the pressure doesn't get less, it gets more. Right. So let, let me ask a very direct question in that light. Uh, so this past week, you have 20 uh, former U.S. attorneys, all of them Republicans, who come out and say we are endorsing Joe Biden because we feel that Donald Trump is a threat to the rule of law in this country. Do the two of you see it in that stark, uh, in those stark terms? Is that an exaggeration uh, by people who were once part of the establishment and are now on the outside? How, how would you respond to that? Is he a threat? David, I'll begin with you. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think he's a threat. Um, I think, but it's not a threat in the, in the way that, uh, a lot of people conceive it. In other words, that he will somehow that, that his judges that he's confirmed are corrupt or that the judges that he's confirmed are people who are just going to do whatever he wants. I think actually when, when the, 
um, story is told 25, 30 years from now of the quote unquote Trump judges, what you're going to see are a lot of pretty um, insightful, often quite thoughtful, quite uh, also conventional conservative legal minds who are classical liberal by and large, by and large. So I don't think you're, you, he's not stocking the federal courts with cronies. He's, he's stocking the federal courts with a lot of really smart lawyers who, who achieved the vast majority of their reputation in the pre-Trump era. It's a federalist society pipeline and the federalist society is, does not depend on Donald Trump. Uh, so that, let me put that aside. The, the, where you get the pressure, where the, you have the threat to the rule of law is the view of the president that the rule of law is essentially that the law is essentially and functionally instrumental, that it is valid when it, when it reinforces his, the, his preferred outcomes. And it, it is invalid when it, when it rules against him. And that there's this sort of relentless pressure. And this is a cultural pressure that says amongst a political base, the law is valid when it advances my partisan interests. And when it defeats my partisan interests, it is somehow corrupt. And that cultural influence to me is far more uh, dangerous than this judge or that judge, which by and large, the judges are really quite, and I hate to use the term conventional because it sounds dismissive. It's, it's not meant to be dismissive. It's saying that these are not revolutionary, corrupt magajurists. They are uh, thoughtful conservative jurists who have a particular judicial philosophy that would be appointed and confirmed under a President Rubio, under a President Jeb Bush, uh, under a President Ted Cruz. So that is not a threat. It's that cultural impact of the decaying respect for the law that I think is a threat. Is the rule of law in jeopardy from, from your perspective, Sarah? Or is that an exaggeration? I think uh, everything David said is pretty spot on. The only thing I would add is that to me, the last four years have accelerated a problem that existed before. And what Trump has done is more or less kill the conservative legal movement, which argued uh, since 1982 that it was a process movement and not an outcome movement. Mm -hmm. uh, originalism is a process by which one interprets the law. It doesn't dictate an outcome. And uh, Donald Trump, by making it all outcome-based, and getting that buy-in, not just from his, you know, grassroots supporters, but from U.S. senators, uh, I think they have more or less killed uh, that movement, perhaps. You will still have originalism as a theory, and judges will still adhere to it. But this idea that it had created this voter base, which it had, I, that could be gone at this point. Um, and then the other thing that I think has accelerated that is the media. Uh, you know, we haven't talked a lot about that. This is about the law, but there's no question that the media and the fracturing of the media, the growing partisan distrust in certain media sources has a huge effect on the law. And one of those effects is that when the Supreme Court, for instance, has an opinion, it doesn't say, you know, the Supreme Court applied Chevron and deferred to the administrative agency. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead, I, that would, I mean, clickbait, right? Um, but instead, it only discusses the outcome. Supreme Court sides with Trump. Uh, Supreme Court sides against Trump. That's bad. Uh, that's bad for the rule of law because what it says to every non-lawyer in the country is that these are all just outcome-based decisions, that there is no process behind it. And the rule of law is a process. It is not an outcome. So I think, um, I think there's been some, some problems for a long time. There is no question that Trump has accelerated those faster than I think even um, those who were concerned about his presidency could have appreciated. So, so I want to talk about the, the election itself and, and as we get to, to the, the days that remain and, and the president continues to, to talk about um, the integrity of the election, doubting uh, the, the validity of mail-in balloting. Speaking of law. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, so this, this is still out there in a big way. And, and the question always comes up, what happens if it is a close election? Let's say it is hmm. a close election. What happens then? How much do you think about that possibility? And, and what do you think about that possibility? How concerned should the nation be about the possibility of a contested 
presidential election. David, I'll begin with you and we'll go back to Sarah. Well, less concerned than, you know, perhaps in mid-September, um, but still concerned and more concerned than I've ever been in my adult lifetime. Um, you know, I, I just listened to, I had a good time listening, not to, to promote any other podcast at all, but uh, the Daily had a, a New York Times Daily podcast had this look back at Bush v. Gore. And can you imagine a Bush v. Gore in this political climate? Um, you know, you would not see the gentleman's withdrawal that Al Gore did after the Supreme Court ruled. Uh, you would see probably mass protests. You would see, in all likelihood, street violence. I mean, we already have street violence. Um, but so I'm concerned. And, and here's, here's what concerns me. Um, election law, particularly when you're talking about court intervention, election law is not easy to explain. It's not easy to explain. So you can begin by talking about this thing called the Purcell principle and people's eyes glaze over almost instantaneously. Purcell principle, all they know is in the state of Pennsylvania, for example, ballots that come in three days after, up to three days after election day are still counts, counted. And in the state of Wisconsin, they got to come in by election day and a court caused both of those to happen and they seem contradictory. And then let's suppose that there's a 2,000 or 3,000 vote margin in Wisconsin and there's 25 or 30,000 votes just sitting there that kind of came in afterwards that nobody opens, nobody touches, but the people tried to vote. And they, in fact, you know, those, they're postmarked by election day. They tried diligently to vote by election day in the middle of a pandemic that's just pounding Wisconsin right now. And so you look at these things and you can easily see how somebody would say, um, you, your victory was illegitimate that before election day, more, more Wisconsin's or Pennsylvanians or Floridians or whatever the key states or states are, more people went to the polls or are sealed their envelopes seeking to vote against you than for you. And yet you're still winning. And if you add that on top of it, that perhaps, you know, maybe Trump loses a popular vote again and you lost the popular vote again. How is this legitimate? And, and all the conservative legal beagles can sort of raise their hands and do the well actually thing. Well, actually, let me explain the Purcell principle to you. <laughs> that doesn't fly in a public that is saying, well, who, who was supposed to be president? <laughs> and that, that is something that does actually make me nervous. Um, as of right now, the polling average nationally is uh, eight and a half points. That's big. Um, many of the swing states are either right uh, bumping at the edge of the margin of error or beyond it. But we'll see. I, I, I like what our, our founder said. Uh, someone asked him in a, one of our dispatch events, uh, what do you hope for out of the election? And, and Steve said, one word, clarity. And I think that we should all hope for clarity. Given the, the, the toxic nature of, of our politics today, Sarah, do you share David's concern about how this will be viewed no matter uh, what the outcome, somebody will feel like this is, is not legitimate, simply not legitimate. I am deeply concerned about the feeling of legitimacy. I am increasingly less concerned about the actual closeness of the race. Um, you know, by the way, great plug moment for David's book, Divided We Fall, because it really discusses how negative partisanship has driven this and that regardless of the outcome of this race, you could still have a big fracturing of the country over this, even if it's not a close call. Uh, two points that I would make on this. One, I think it is a huge problem and not one that is being discussed nearly widely enough that Republicans have become the party of not letting people vote, not wanting people to vote, not uh, helping people vote. That's craziness. Um, the idea that you're running a political party on basically a platform of the fewer people, the better. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not great. Now, the Republican Party in the past had been you know, very keen on preventing voter fraud and increasing uh, voting security, voter ID. I actually think that's a different bucket and you can complain about that bucket and say that they were using it for voter suppression. Um, that's a debate to have. 
But we're now in something totally different, which is just, we want to count fewer votes. Um, that's odd. So uh, A, I don't think that's a great political message. Now, <laughs> relatedly, I do think it's worth having a discussion over voter fraud and where fraud can come in and where it really can't. I worked in election day operations for two presidential campaigns and uh, there is no question in my mind that there can be fraud and that there in fact is some amount of fraud in our elections and it's in the hundreds of votes. <laughs> <laughs> it is because of how fractured our elections are. There are 50 elections in this country. Each state does, it own, does its own. There are different machines. There are different ways to vote. And actually all of that weirdly creates more security, not less. It is pretty easy to, um, you know, for instance, in a state that allows ballot harvesting to go into an area, your opponent's uh, a strong, strong precinct for your opponent harvest a bunch of ballots by telling people that you work for your opponent and then throw those ballots in the trash. That is voter fraud. That's illegal. It'd be hard to catch someone. Uh, and that could affect tens of votes in a precinct, maybe even a few hundred. Uh, that could sway a county commissioner election, uh, election for sheriff. Just, no question about that. And that's a problem. And it's not okay. But what I have never seen is someone tell me how you could move 23,000 votes in a practical way. I want someone to walk me through how they're going to do 23,000 votes. You can't unsteam the absentee ballots, change the, you know, put in the different ballot and reseal them 23,000 times. The ROI on doing that for a campaign uh, would be outrageous compared to just trying to get more people to vote for you. Um, so uh, I just would encourage people who are concerned about the legitimacy of an election that appears clear in its outcome, who then say that it was stolen in a nefarious way, to really walk through how that can happen at a large scale. Uh, it is not particularly possible at the computer level either. When you look at um, actually, again, where the poor security kind of comes in handy. It's very easy to see if someone gets into the system and screws around with it. It's actually hard to prevent them from doing it to some extent, but pretty easy to see when it's happened. Uh, there's duplication, there's a canvassing process. So again, I will be the person out there saying um, the election is more legitimate than the people saying it's illegitimate think it is. One final now, to be question. fair, Sarah, the, um, some of the people who are going to be walking through mass scale vote fraud have already convinced themselves that America's run by a Hollywood pedophile cannibal child sex ring. So you know what? I don't have any evidence that it's not on that front, but I do have experience <laughs> in securing voter, <laughs> voter it, it wouldn't have been an hour without a QAnon reference. It would just, would just be, it's got to get in there somehow. I'm going to ask you each a final question, then I want to give David a chance to talk about his book for a moment. But um, here's my final question to each of you. Uh, what happens to the Republican Party? Each of you are conservatives. Um, you, you've cared about this party over the years. You have obviously differences of opinion with Donald Trump, um, uh, but, but you care about uh, what the party used to be and you care about the conservative movement. What does the Republican Party look like, A, if Donald Trump wins, B, if he loses? David, I'll begin with you. Oh, it's a e super easy answer if it wins. Um, it will be the tightest bond between a politician and, a, and a, an electorate that I've we've ever seen perhaps in the modern American era because he will have overcome great odds not once but twice. And in fact, maybe even overcome greater odds this time than last time. It will mean that he was wrong, right? Everybody else was wrong. Uh, the world was against them and yet they prevailed anyway. I mean, the level of, uh, of joy and devotion if you think there is a huge was a huge amount of joy and devotion after 2016, just just wait. It will be Trump's party, um, and, it and means there will they be trust Trump and no one else because exactly. everyone else said he would lose, and Trump was the only person they could trust to tell them the outcome. Yes, yes, it will. You know, and that's why I say it will be Trump's party, not Trumpism's party. Trump's party. Um, now, if he loses, I you know. I, I think a lot depends on sort of the margin. Um, on the one end, if it's a big loss, 
then I think all bets are off as far as what is the future of the party. Um, you'll have some people saying, well, sort of populism is the message and that was the wrong messenger or maybe it's the right messenger, but he was just betrayed and we need to purge all of the people who betrayed him or further purge <laughs> or that Trumpism was bad. Let's not do that again. And let's return to a different kind of um, 2016 informed version of republicanism that is, but is not populist. It's all bets are off. I think if it's a big loss, if it's a narrow loss, whoo, um, you know, I think those of us who've been anti-Trump conservatives will be seen as sort of the Benedict Arnold's who did this. Um, you might have a, a real faction between the populists who say, right message, wrong messenger, and the Trumpists who say right message and right messenger, he was just betrayed. Um, but I, I think it's only wide open if it's a significant loss. But, you know, I'd love to hear what Sarah thinks about that. That That's my, my short assessment. The only thing I'll add to that is that uh, I have a bet going that if Trump loses, regardless of whether by a large or small amount, and he chooses to run again in 2024, <laughs> He will be the Republican nominee in 2024. Really? Yeah, that's that's interesting. <laughs> What's the one other wild card is? I think <laughs> if he loses, you're going to have some of his spell broken with some of his folks, sure. and there will there will be stories that will come out about his time in office that are new. They're not different in kind. I mean, sort of like we kind of know what his White House is like, but there'll be new stories. And you'll sort of see this really convenient maneuver that some people do that will be something like, well, if I only knew that, <laughs> if I'd known that thing, then I wouldn't have been on board with him. But, you know, too bad I didn't know it before. Now I know. So I want to end on a happy note. And we'll talk about David's book, Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. And I just uh, wanted to make sure you had a chance to, to talk about why you wrote this book, David. What what is your greatest concern about the, the growing ideological gap in America? Wait, David, before you start, I need to tell people, if you buy this book, which you absolutely should, <laughs> go to page 119. What, what chapter is it, David? Chapter five? Uh, well, it's chapter one of the middle section. So yeah, okay. chapter one of the middle section. I think it's page chapter 12. Five. Chapter okay. 12. It's chapter 12, page roughly 119 in my version. Hopefully your edition's the same. Just like dive in, you won't put it down. Make sure you've left enough time to finish that section before you need to go to sleep or else you will be up till 3 a.m. reading like <laughs> I was. It is, it is novel-esque. That is not like any politically pundity book you have ever read. That, that's so a great tease, sir. I used to work at television. That's a that's a, a heck of a tease. That's very And good. that's a wrap. I cannot improve on that. That's, yeah. I, no royalties from this book for some reason. <laughs> Um, I, I'll just say, I'll say it like this as I say it in the first chat, first paragraph of the first chapter is that there is no single truly important political, social, religious, or cultural force that is pulling Americans together more than it's pushing us apart. And since that is true, and it's since uh, political animosity and rage and anger is growing, that if these trends continue, we can't guarantee that the United States will remain together. And and so what I tried to do in writing the book was to explain why these trends are not only bad, but self-reinforcing. In other words, they sort of create their own momentum. Hatred, polarization creates its own momentum. Geographic separation creates its own momentum. And that these forces don't show any signs of slowing down at all. And we've had a lot of books writing about polarization that you know people don't like each other, right? That, that people are divided. But what I said is, let's imagine this just keeps going. Because what a lot of people think is, well, we're really divided, but then I'm going to win. You know, we're really divided, and, but eventually the other side is just going to lose. Well, what a lot of these trends say is that that hope for domination is, a, is sort of a fool's hope. It's a fool's errand to believe that you can dominate. And if you cannot dominate and there's increasing division, uh, we have to figure out a way to accommodate or we could have a catastrophe. David French and Sarah Isger from The Dispatch, the uh, co-hosts of the podcast, Advisory Opinions. I, I really enjoyed the visit today. Thanks so much for, for taking time to, to spend with us. And, uh, and thanks again to everybody who's been watching today. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time on The Issues, everybody. Bye-bye.